my name is Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times telling you what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This week a jaw-dropping story, courtesy of Byline Times writer Julian Mercer, who'll be telling us we're building too many houses. Now that might seem counterintuitive at a time when millions of people can't get a foot on the housing ladder or afford a decent place to rent. The government has set a target to build 300,000 new homes a year. But as we'll hear, we could end up with ghost estates as a result. In the meantime, residents in one Midlands town have been left to cope with the impact of thousands of new neighbours. They're worried about whether they can register with a dentist. They're finding it more difficult to get GP appointments. The roads are clogged up. You go down the Leicester Road, they're queuing right down a dual carriageway all the way down to get into a shopping centre. It's just ruined the town, really. It it has. In the capital, the building boom is generating a new phenomenon. Never mind buy to let, this is buy to leave. People, especially foreign investors, are moving into central London. They're buying up all these massive big tower blocks that are popping up all along the Thames. And they're just leaving them because they know that with such a rampant inflationary housing market, they're getting, I mean, what is it? 14% prices have risen this year. You find a bank account somewhere where you can get 14% interest. It's a no-brainer. I'm really excited to share this week's episode with you. Prepare to be amazed. I know I was when I started looking into it. First, though, a reminder to check out our brilliant news-breaking website, bylinetimes.com, where, as well as fine investigative journalism and sharp topical comment, you'll also find details of how to subscribe to the monthly Byline Times newspaper, which funds this podcast. It's a snip at £36 a year and ensures that we can provide a real alternative to Murdoch and the Mail. Find out more at bylinetimes.com. Now, house building is one of the shibboleths of the modern Conservative Party and its supporters in the media. First time buyers, rising house prices, these are the stuff of a Daily Mail wet dream. But concern over planning reforms that would make it easier to build on Greenbelt land were also widely cited as a reason for the Tories' defeat in the recent Chesham and Amersham by election. So, can it really be true that too many new homes are being built in England? Well, yes, it can. This story starts in Coventry, where environmental campaigner Merle Goering couldn't understand estimates by the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, suggesting that the city would grow by nearly a third in the next decade, necessitating an additional 42,000 houses. Merle started scrutinising the figures, and when Coventry City Council presented its plans to the public, he was primed and ready to go. By 2016, you know, we had a really convincing case about, you know what, ONS has used the wrong birth rates, that they're exaggerating the number of people being born here by a thousand a year. So that's substantial. So over 20 years, that inflates the population by 20,000. And you know what, if you look at the people dying, they aren't counting the, the, uh, the coffins well enough. That, that there are actually more coffins going in the ground than they than they allow for. So that was subtracting from the, their alleged growth. And, and then the worst thing, though, was we were able to show very clearly that they were not counting the number of students leaving the city correctly. That we know from very good data at the time that there are about six and a half thousand foreign students graduating each year from Coventry universities, the two universities, Warwick and Coventry University. And there were, there were about six and a half thousand of, of Chinese and Indian and non-European students. And we know from very good data that around 90% of them, 95% of them, leave very promptly after they graduate. So that means like, well, you've got six and a half thousand graduating, must be, you know, something around 6,000 leave the town. And yet ONS had less than 3,000 leaving the town. So the other 3,000 are just allegedly staying here in their numbers, in their accounting, inflating the numbers. Well, over 20 years, that makes the, the town, you know, it, it, inc- the, the, makes the population increase too large by 60,000. So we had a very good case. We could show the mechanism we had support from expert, world experts. You know, we had 
professors at Oxford and professors at Newcastle saying, you know what, your analysis looks pretty good. You've understood the data and what's there and what, what you can get from it. But at that point, the inspector, who was supposed to be independent, ignored us. We asked, it, we asked a really big question in those hearings. We asked Coventry Council, we asked the consultants that employed by the council at enormous expense. Well, tell us why would Coventry start to behave like a, a racehorse who's going to win the derby in the population race? It's one of the fastest growing places in the country. There's got to be a reason in the real world. Now, tell us why. Has gold been discovered beneath Lady Godiva's statue? Is some huge enterprise going to move here? Is Parliament going to move lock, stock, and barrel to Coventry? What earth-shattering event is going to happen that would ac account for this? Because we know that in the early years of this century, there were two censuses in 2001 and 2011. And in those years, Coventry was just plodding along as far as population growth is concerned. You know, it was number 228 as far as towns and local and cities go in this country. So why, after 2011, would country suddenly explode? Well, what was the reason? Really, there was a, a blindingly obvious problem with the Coventry numbers. Yes, I can see something under Lady Godiva's horse as well. And it certainly isn't gold. Whiffs a bit too. Merle was vindicated earlier this year by a ruling from the watchdog, the Office of Statistics Regulation. They said that the ONS figures did indeed seem to be at odds with reality in smaller cities with a large student population, like Coventry. They called for more work to be done to investigate the root and scale of this issue. The ONS was also criticised for the way it dealt with challenges like Merle's. He reckons another 50 English towns and cities could be affected by similarly flawed data. So what about the impact of all this possibly unnecessary house building on England's beautiful countryside and the people who live close to it? I've been to Rugby, a town of fewer than 80,000 people, but where in 2019 planners envisaged more than 12,000 additional homes, some of them overspill from neighbouring Coventry. I met up with a long-time resident who was also an opposition councillor. Hi, I'm Maggie O'Rourke. I'm a local Labour councillor and I'm the leader of the Labour group on Rugby Borough Council. I've lived in Rugby for most of my life now and we're currently just outside of the village of Bilton on a lane called Corston Lane and we're looking at lots of new built houses that have been built on Greenbelt land. And as we came to this point, Maggie, you were keen to give me the grand tour of rugby and you've taken me on a circle around the town and almost everywhere that we've been, there have been new build developments. One estate which will have 6,000 homes on it and that's only the start for the outskirts of rugby. That's right. I mean, th that plot of land was actually earmarked quite a long time ago and it's nearly 6,500 houses that are going to be built there. But what wasn't identified was all this other sort of green belt land. And for me, the problem is, you know, it's not about building houses. We all know that we need to build houses, but it's building houses in the right place. Rugby is a very small market town. It has very little infrastructure. It hasn't got the ability to have uh, sort of ring roads and dual carriageways around it because half of the town is actually owned by rugby school. So there's no way we can actually build an infrastructure around the town that will support all of these new developments. Now, I know uh, people are concerned about buffers around these greenfield sites as well, which we are as a group, and, and you know the environmental sustainability of them. But one thing that's never considered in all of this is how they mitigate the sort of knock-on effect on our town centre areas in the urban wards if you if you're bringing another 30 or 40,000 people to live in rugby they will need to go to the town centre to access GP surgeries to access dentists to go to chemists to to go to post office wh whatever it might be and that means that there's a lot more people coming through our town 
people will say, well, that's good for the town centre. Well, of course it's good for the town centre, but what isn't good for the people that live in the town centre is all that extra sort of pollution that's coming in with cars. Our sort of public transport system is really poor and the Tories have given no thought whatsoever to investing in that public transport that we need to actually sustain this type of build that we've currently got. As we were driving around, it struck me how modern many of the housing developments are. Many of these houses have been built in the last 10 years and the plan is to build thousands more in rugby. What did this area look like before the houses we're looking at now were built? It was all open and uh, green belt land, you know, it was all countryside. Um, it stopped at the edge of the village, Bilton Village, which is about half a mile or so down the road. Um, and we're just in the middle of it. I mean, it's going to go another mile past us where we are and it's going to go four miles across the other way into that, the green fields we can see behind us yeah, and down the down the lane right. there yeah and as you can see where we're sitting at the moment adrian there's a big sign up calling for more land more land's required so de- developers are still trying to buy more land i think the people of rugby are just sick and tired of it they're really fed up with the fact that there's not enough services that the hospital has very limited services locally they're good services you know i work in the health service the people are brilliant there but the services are limited the fact of the matter is that this town has become a commuter town the people that are coming to live here understand why they get a lot more money for their box than what they might do in north london and they can commute to london in 47 minutes problem is that our station our local station it will be we will not be able to cope with all these extra people and we haven't got a plan in place yet for the next stage in terms of building another station. The other thing is we've been told, this is great, we're going to have lots of affordable houses for local young people to buy and they're not affordable. I mean, can you see any affordable... They're, they're all executive four-bedroom, five-bedroom houses. There's the odd one or two sort of semis, but... There's nothing, you can't buy anything under £300,000, you know, and that is not something that the young people can afford. What makes it even worse, of course, this really annoys me, I have to say, what makes it worse is the ward that I represent, which uh, is where the the, the train station is and it's full of terraces, terrace houses it's probably the only place where young people could afford to buy a house a terrace house and guess what's happening they're all being uh, turned into houses of multi-occupancy and the council have done nothing and put nothing in the local plan to stop the oversaturation and concentration of a house of multi-occupancy and we're seeing you know we talk about a leveling up agenda but this it's all part of this plan this is what's happening people can't afford to buy houses so they're having to live in houses of multi-occupancy that's not good for their health and well-being and we've seen in the figures in terms of covid the people living in these places tend to work in factories they work shift work they can't be doing agile working they're more li- likely to get covid they've got no garden to go and sit in it's it's just an absolute nightmare to be quite honest and the houses that we're looking at as you say very much executive homes there might be small terraces of maybe three houses together but they're three stories these look like four bedroom houses that we're looking at and that has been the story of the homes that you've shown me all around rugby these are not first time buyer houses The minutes of the local plan committee will show how local councillors have raised massive concerns about all these new developments and the fact that they're so able, the developers, to argue their way out of providing the affordable housing that this government said was going to happen with all these new developments. And I think we're looking, you know, instead of 30%, about 5 or 6%. It's just, it, it's just awful, yeah. The figures are being questioned about Coventry and, of course, rugby as a neighbour is affected by the planning calculations for Coventry. Have local councillors raised objections and said, well, look, the regulator has asked the Office of National Statistics to review the basis of those figures for the the whole Coventry area? 
Yes, we did actually. Uh, we, the Labour group at the last meeting put forward or wanted to put forward an amendment to actually say to them when they were passing through the plan, there's a supplementary plan that supports the local plan for these extra 5,000 houses to be built. We asked to put forward an amendment saying, hang on a minute, can we just wait and see if we actually need to be building all of these houses? Because we're hearing that Coventry are looking at what's going on, they're waiting to see what the findings are going to be from the ONS data can we just wait and see we didn't want you know we want to change anything just wait and see because we might need to review our local plan in fact they blocked us from actually putting forward the amendment one thing that intrigues me is that rugby is very much a staunch conservative local council area yet the conservatives lost the parliamentary seat of Amersham because local people were concerned about the scale of developments there. In this area, it seems that local people are willing to accept it. There appears to be no backlash against the scale of developments. I think there has been some backlash, to be fair. And I think people are starting to realise now that this isn't very good. And actually, if you do look in the local papers, they are saying, look, hang on a minute. They're worried about the infrastructure issues. They're worried about not being able to get their kids into the local school. They're worrying about having to travel to two or three schools with their kids because they can't get them all into the same school. They're worried about whether they can register with a dentist. They're finding it more difficult to get GP appointments. The roads are clogged up. You go down the Leicester Road, they're queuing right down a dual carriageway all the way down to get into a shopping centre. It's just ruined the town, really. It, it has. And I'm not against building. I'm, I'm not, because I do understand that we need to have plenty of houses built for people. But this is not, to me, this is not local need. And, you know, if it's more than local need and they need people to move around a bit more, then there should have been a plan to design new houses and start from scratch rather than try and turn a market town into a, a city. Maggie O'Rourke, leader of the Labour Group on the Conservative-led Rugby Borough Council. Now, sharp-eared listeners might have spotted what sounds like a contradiction somewhere along the line here. There is clearly demand for the suburban palaces that Maggie and I saw. So how can it also be true that we're building too many houses? Freelance journalist Julian Mercer has the answer. He's written about this story extensively for Byline Times, and he told me that his interest was sparked by developments that were literally close to home. In my neighbourhood of the Welsh English borders, there was suddenly a whole series of new housing developments. And the area in question is a pretty small, modest population, two or three thousand. And suddenly we were looking at probably another thousand people moving in with these new developments almost overnight. And it just felt like Certainly on a local basis, I could not understand how that need could have been calculated. That coincided with Theresa May in 2017 announcing the government's famous pledge to build 300,000 new houses a year in England, which would be the highest ever number of new housing achieved by any government in our history. I'm not talking about replacements of demolition. I'm talking about new additions to housing stock. And I thought, wow, so we're just the thin end of the wedge here. And then in, I think it was Channel 4's coverage of the white paper announcing the 300,000, they had a brief moment where an economist called Ian Mulhern popped up saying, but hang on a minute, there is no need for this number of houses. The demographic data simply does not support a demand for 300,000 houses a year. So what's going on? And it was that kind of perfect storm, really, that got me interested in the subject. And I've been sort of mildly obsessed with it ever since. (laughs) And uh, Merle Goering's analysis suggests that the ONS had got its data wrong, that they'd overcounted the number of university students who would stay on in many towns. And the regulator, the OSR, has now vindicated Merle's stance. Absolutely. And I think what's really interesting about that is that Merle has gone on from his obsession like mine with Coventry to calculate that there are another 50 towns and cities across the UK who have similar problems. And we know now that Guildford, which has a big student population, is reviewing its local plan. 
Oxford is going to a judicial review. In fact, the judicial review has been heard and we're awaiting judgment on it. Again, a question of whether there are just simply too many houses for the local need. And part of the factor there, of course, is is that Oxford is a big university town. So that this is a common problem. But it's actually only a small part of the overall problem, which is that the demographic data, not just involving university populations and students, but the demographic data generally across the country points to a shortening need rather than a massively expanding housing need. And so there are lots of different ways of illustrating this point, and Coventry is a good one, but it's certainly not the sort of central explanation as to why we're in this situation. And what's interesting about your research is that it demonstrates that housing costs have not come down, even though the supply has significantly increased, nor has homelessness or the need for housing, as it were, at the bottom end of the market, been significantly reduced? It's a crisis of affordability. And by that, I mean genuine affordability in the form of council housing or social housing or housing associations providing low rent accommodation for people. That's at the heart of this problem. And what we have is a situation where private developers are ensuring that their profit margins are actually ring-fenced by government, a minimum of 15% profit on their turnover per year. And that means that they're constantly seeking to make a lot of money out of the properties they build and are pushing these new properties way beyond the reach of the people who need them. So there is something in the order of about 5 million people in this country who you could say need housing. The smallest number are the, say, quarter of a million who are homeless. Then there's at least a million people who are on council waiting lists. And then there's at least three million people who are reluctantly sleeping on the sofa with mum and dad because they simply can't afford to buy anywhere and and increasingly can't afford even to rent anywhere. Because the private sector is controlling the market, rents are not at affordable levels. So all we're doing in building, building, building is super serving those people who already are on the property ladder and increasing the gap, the affordability gap, for the people to whom this solution to the crisis is being proposed. On the face of it, in theory, if you increase the housing stock, then people who are lower down the private housing chain will be able to buy one of these new houses. That will create a vacancy lower down the housing chain, theoretically allowing a first-time buyer to get onto the market. Why isn't that happening? Well, I'm sure it is happening to some extent, but nowhere near the extent that's required to solve the crisis. And I think that what we're seeing is a huge increase in multiple property ownership. There are approaching two-thirds of a million empty homes across England. And that's growing. And that's a number which is thought by most people to be a serious underestimate because there are council tax penalties now for leaving a home empty for too long. So people aren't declaring it as much as perhaps they might. There's a massive increase in second homes. It's reckoned that there's well over a million homes in existence at the moment which are unavailable because they're either empty or they're occupied as weekend retreats. And the reason why this is happening is because Interest rates are so low, property is the best form of investment for most people at the moment. You're not going to put your money into a building society or an ISA account. If you've got money, you're going to put it into a property purchase. And that's what people are doing. And there's a massive number of properties, especially in the most affluent parts of central London, which are known as buy to leave, not buy to let, buy to leave. People, especially foreign investors, are moving into central London. They're buying up all these massive big tower blocks that are popping up all along the Thames. And they're just leaving them because they know that with such a rampant inflationary housing market, they're getting, I mean, what is it? 14% prices have risen this year. You find a bank account somewhere where you can get 14% interest. It's a no-brainer. And you can't blame the investors for doing that. I'm sure we'd all do it if we had the money to do it. But... (laughs) They're the ones who are being super served by this crazy chase to 300,000 houses a year. It's not making any impact at all on those 5 million people who are in the midst of the crisis. 
And at the starter home level, as you say, there will be some people who are able to buy a new home who've never owned one before. But there will also be these other investors, if you like, smaller investors who think "Hmm, two up, two down or a terrace three bedroom property. Maybe instead of my pension pot just sitting there and earning not very much money, I can release a significant amount of that cash. I can buy that property up and then I can make money by renting it out. That seems to be a a significant factor at play here as well. Absolutely. But they're under no social obligation to rent out at affordable rates. They're doing it as a financial investment. And so they're making sure that the rents they get back are market rents. Just an interesting stat. The government have a target of affordable housing. They say that we should aim for 40% of new builds to be affordable. In 2019, when we built 240,000 plus new houses in England, 20,000 of them were affordable. And what affordable actually means in the government's definition is 80% of market prices, purchase price or rental rates. 80% is still way beyond the means of most of the people in this crisis. So we're in a situation where if there isn't some concerted pressure by government, I would argue, to bring in social housing or housing associations who are providing housing at genuinely affordable levels, then this crisis will roll on and on and on, if not get worse and worse and worse. So there's no denying that there is housing need. The point here really is is that the kinds of houses that are being built are not affordable for the people who are in housing need. does very little to address their problems. What it does, though is fatten the bank balances of the developers and the house builders. It gives opportunities for investors, whether small-time investors in the UK or overseas investors, but it does not deal with the problem that it's designed to solve. There is no denying. I think people who follow this argument, me included, are often accused of trying to deny that there is a housing crisis. And of course, we need more housing. That's by no means my argument. I think Shelter calculate that if we were to build 150,000 social houses per year instead of 300,000 private sector houses, that we could genuinely address the housing crisis. So there is a need. There's no denying that. But their calculation is that the target housing level is half of that which the government are imposing and that that half has to be affordable, genuinely affordable. And what we've got is a situation where we've got twice the level that is actually needed and a very small proportion of that being genuinely affordable. The rest of it is is doing absolutely nothing to address the housing crisis. I was interested in your comment earlier when you said that house builders' profits are ring-fenced, guaranteed by government. I'm sure that will be news to many listeners. Just explain that, please. Well, in the government's documentation accompanying the National Planning Policy Framework, there is a paragraph which says that developers should be expected to obtain profit levels of between 15 and 20 percent. And what that means, and what has been going on now for quite a few years and has been observed as notorious by quite a few other people, is that A developer typically takes possession of a plot of land, gets permission to build, may even start cutting turf and getting on with it, and then goes back to the council and says, "Uh, sorry about this, but your affordability quota, that 40% we're supposed to build, if we do that, we won't be able to guarantee 15 to 20% profit. So you either have to allow us to reduce that percentage or we'll walk away. And we'll leave the half bulldozed field that we were going to build on for you to clean up. And time after time after time, councils who are being squeezed left, right and centre by austerity and by other financial penalties that are too complicated to explain, cave in. In Manchester, for three years up to 2019, when there were many, many developments, there was not a single affordable house built because of viability assessments. And what's more, these viability assessments take place in secret, in camera, in council meetings, because it's about commercial confidentiality, so they're allowed to protect data. The council in Manchester went bonkers and voted to turn those meetings into open affairs so that people could see for themselves why these decisions were being made. It beggars belief. 
But that stipulation that developers should make at least 15% profit means that they have a stick with which to beat local councils and drive down the amount of affordable housing units. Absolutely. And it's happened. That's why this supposed 40% target, which has been talked about quite a lot by ministers, was only 10% in 2019. And we'll wait to see what the figure turns out to be in 2020. But everybody accepts, including government, that the affordability quotas are simply not being met anywhere. And of course, Boris Johnson's latest planning proposals, which are going down like a well, I won't say, but Boris Johnson's latest planning proposals include even more freedoms for developers and even fewer opportunities to control them for councils. So we're going in the opposite direction. And incidentally, on that point about the latest planning proposals, Coventry, Merle's Council, are looking at a further 35% increase in their housing target as a result of the latest white paper. And of course, the 15% profit guarantee, as it were, is only a percentage. In in hard cash terms, if you're a developer, you still want to make as much money, as much money in raw terms as you possibly can. I wonder if that's what drives these developments of executive homes on the edge of town, which is what I witnessed in rugby, these kind of three or four bedroomed suburban palaces rather than in-city terraces that that might yield less money. Absolutely. I can only agree with you on that. The profits of the major house builders have rocketed in recent years, in line with the increase in the housing target. And it's reckoned that Persimmon, who notoriously paid their outgoing chief executive a bonus of something in order of £70 million pounds payoff, they make a profit on each house they sell of £66,000. And if their £66,000 is in any way jeopardised, they won't build. They'll turn around to the council and say, it's a viability assessment. Sorry about that. The Office of National Statistics has been criticised in your articles and by people like Merle. They have revised their estimates of housing need downwards, more generally, to something like 200,000 a year. It's one of the curious features of this story is that that doesn't appear to be filtering through to local authorities. The local authorities aren't allowed to use the data. The government determined that any demographic data produced by the ONS on either household formation rates or overall population projections could not be used beyond 2014 and beyond 2014. So so, so let me just get this right then. The government is deliberately using out-of-date, inaccurate figures which overestimate housing need. And even if their own Office of National Statistics contradicts that, local councils are not allowed to use that in evidence? Absolutely. That's written in law. Uh, I mean, that, that, that sounds both shocking and crazy. This gets to the very heart of the whole argument, but it also becomes slightly complicated. Allow me to try in a few seconds to summarise. There are two specific aspects of the demographic that the ONS oversees. One is the projections of the rate of household formation. Because obviously, if you're a planning authority, you can't just build houses overnight. You've got to have an idea of what you need to build over the years to come. So they rely entirely on household formation prediction rates and household formation rates were increasing steadily right through the 20th century and it was assumed in the 21st century that they would continue to do so and that housing need would continue to increase but a strange thing happened around the time of the millennium the rate at which households increased flattened. What happened was that the number of people in each household, the average number per household, which had been dropping through the 20th century, thereby creating a need for more but less populated houses, that number flattened. And therefore, the need for housing, it didn't stop, but the rate of growth started to reduce. Well, the government wrote this off as a temporary economic aberration, something to do with especially the financial crash of 2008. And they said we'd make a big mistake if we started downturning our figures on that basis because 
look, this is a blip and we'll be back to the normal trend in no time at all. Well, 20 years on from the millennium, there has been no change in that at all. But the housing targets that government have set have continued to assume that rise. So they have been exaggerating on an increasing basis for 20 years. And the economist Ian Mulhern that I mentioned at the beginning calculates that we've been overbuilding houses at the rate of 80,000 per year ever since, which is a pretty extraordinary statistic, but actually does rather merge with the number of empty homes and second homes and Airbnb homes that there are in this country. So I told you it was complicated. That then leads to the ONS who do their own calculations and say, hang on, this isn't a temporary blip. This is a demographic shift and we have to take it into account. And so, as you say, their predictions brought the housing need figure down to about 220,000, not 300,000. Government said the famous quote from the Ministry of Housing was methodological changes do not change the government's aspiration to build 300,000 homes a year. These aren't methodological changes. It's not, you haven't got a new battery in the calculator. This is the way we are living that has changed, but the government is inconvenient for some interesting reason. I know not what. The government don't want to know about it. The other thing, I told you it was complicated, but maybe this is simpler. It's complicated, but it's interesting. (laughs) Good. Our population, the UK population, has been steadily increasing for centuries. And in recent years, especially since freedom of movement in the European Union, our population increase was in the order of about 250 to 350,000 people a year, which is a lot of people. And that, therefore, you might expect requires a lot of houses. But Brexit and the pandemic has driven a coach and horses through this whole thing. And the Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence, which is a think tank, a a nerd's think tank, if ever there was one, but whose advisory board includes the Chief Economist of the Bank of England and the Director General of the Statistics Regulator, calculate that since the double whammy of the pandemic and Brexit, That 300,000 increase in population has gone into serious reverse. And in the last year, they reckon 1.3 million people have left this country. What impact does that have on our calculation of housing need? Government says that the predictions of household formation and the predictions of population change can only be taken from 2014. We cannot as a planning authority or as an individual, take into account the fact that our way of lives and our population changes have gone through massive change in the last few years and they're not allowed to consider it. So if you're in opposition to a local plan and you have a planning inspector, the planning inspector just says, I'm really sorry, but it says on this piece of paper, I can't take this into account. So we have to consider the out-of-date data that still shows the exaggerating need or the increasing population. You couldn't make it up, Adrian. (laughs) If you were cynical, you might be tempted to point to the significant donations made to the Conservative Party by developers and by house builders, and they are really quite significant. But as we saw in the Amersham by-election, there is a political cost to be paid for this. And the Lib Dems were thought to have won that by-election because They promoted preservation of the Green Belt, whereas the Conservatives were still promoting this house building agenda. In terms of that calculation, if the figures that we're talking about were more widely known, surely this would be toxic for the Tories. Well, the one thing that I can't get my head around about this whole thing is just how much longer they can sustain this position. Because ultimately, we're going to start seeing ghost estates. We're going to start seeing more and more green belt ripped up for no visible benefit. I just don't know how long they can sustain their housing policy. And yes, I think it may well bring about some common sense in this whole debate. There may well be a change in attitude. There's supposedly a lot of rethinking going on right now about those planning changes that are under proposal that would result in Coventry having this 35% increase in in what's already an outrageous number. I'm not going to make political predictions, but it does seem like 
it's such an insane policy that its days must surely be numbered. Julian Mercer, and I do urge you to track down all the articles Julian has written on this subject for Byline Times. One other factor to bear in mind is that house buyers are not on an equal footing. Since the financial crash, risky lending has been discouraged, so an older investor with a chunk of equity in another property will find it much easier to borrow than a young couple seeking a 95% mortgage. This is key to understanding how first-time buyers can be locked out even of a growing market. I was also really struck by Julian's claim that we already have more than enough housing stock for the size of England's population. More than enough, and that if we build at the rate of 300,000 new homes a year, that gap will widen. For confirmation, I went to his original source, former Treasury economist Ian Mulhern. We know that at the moment there are around 1.2 million more houses in England than there are households. And that surplus has doubled over the past 25 years. Back in the mid-90s, it was around 600,000, and now it's 1.2 million. Now, the ONS thinks that by 2030, we'll need about 25.1 million households in the UK. Now, if we were to build at 300,000 houses per year, that would mean that there'd be about 2.5 million more houses than there are households in the country by 2030. So we'd have this very big surplus stock. And inevitably, a lot of that is going to go perhaps long term vacant or whatever. So that doesn't seem like a particularly sensible way to go. But even if you know you build at 200,000 houses per year on the ONS's projections, we'd still be increasing that surplus stock of houses from about 1.2 million today to about 1.7 million by the end of this decade. So on the ONS projections, we can expect to see a steady increase in the excess stock of housing. And now there are quite good reasons why you want to have some excess in your housing stock. You need that spare capacity. But whether we need to be aiming for millions of unoccupied homes is doubtful. And there is a risk at some point that you build too many and these houses just go long term vacant and it's a complete waste of money and you end up with some of the ghost towns that we saw in housing booms in Spain and Ireland. It's not the case that ever more building is always a good thing. Ian Mulhern bringing to a close this episode of the Byline Times podcast. And thanks again to Julian Mercer for sharing his brilliant journalism, which you can read more of in the Byline Times. Don't forget, it's subscriptions to our monthly paper, The Byline Times, that pay for this podcast. So please subscribe if you can at bylinetimes.com. That's bylinetimes.com. Thanks for listening. See you next week.